The time has come to experience terror at Collinwood. I am your hostess, Penny Dreadful, a.k.a. Danielle, and I'm looking forward to my discussion with Vikram Mather about the cross-cultural and cross-generational impact of Dark Shadows. But before we get to the show, I have an update on the Dark Shadows Remembrance Weekend. Unfortunately, the Marriott Burbank Airport Hotel has reached its limit on discounted rooms for the DS Remembrance Weekend, although there are some rooms available at the standard hotel rate. The nearby option is Ramada by Wyndham Burbank Airport. You can call 1-800-922-5548 for more information. Ramada offers free breakfast, free parking for guests, and a free shuttle to and from the Burbank Airport. Attendees can walk across the street Hollywood Way from the Burbank Airport to the Marriott. This is, of course, happening on July 5th and 6th. July 5th is a celebration of life for Lara Parker, and July 6th, is the Jonathan Frid Centenary. Lots of great stuff happening. This is one of those things where if you can make it, go. Because who knows if there's anything like this will ever happen again. That said, the 60th anniversary of Dark Shadows is coming up uh, in two years. So, I mean, I would hope something happens for the 60th anniversary. If nothing is planned for the 60th anniversary, then... uh, I think, uh, guys, we gotta we gotta do something about that. We gotta we gotta make that happen. Anyway, uh, also the Rondo Hatton Classic Horror Awards voting is about to end. Voting ends on Tuesday, April sixteenth at midnight. And uh, Terror at Collinwood is nominated for Best Podcast. Uh, If you want to vote for Terror at Collinwood, I would certainly appreciate it, but certainly don't feel obligated. There are so many other great podcasts listed there. Uh, Other Dark Shadows themed uh, things that are uh, nominated. Dark Shadows Daybook Unbound by Patrick McRae. Collinsport Historical Society website. Ansel Farage's Todd Tarantula, which stars David Selby. Uh, So lots of Dark Shadows specific stuff, plus guests who have been on the podcast before are nominated. Amanda Desiree, Rod Labby, Donald F. Glute, Mark DeWidziak, Sam Irvin, Stephen Turek, Diecast Movie Podcast. You can write in Classic Horrors Club Podcast. Lots of good stuff. Uh, And also uh, Penny Dreadful is nominated for uh, Favorite Horror Host. Uh, I have not been super active as a horror hostess in in a while. I mean, I do things here and there, but uh, it is nice to be on the ballot. Um, but yes, you can still vote in the Rondo Awards. The way to vote is to write into Terraco, T-A-R-A-C-O, at AOL.com. And you can vote in as many or in as few categories as you want. You can see the full ballot at RondoAward.com. And when you submit your email to Terraco at AOL.com, you want to just make sure that you sign the email. Just put your name on it just so that your vote is counted. And with that said, let's get to the show. <laughs> To terror at Collinwood, tis I, Penny Dreadful, taking on the form of Danielle, and I am joined today by a very special guest, Vikram Mather. He's been a film critic for the American Bazaar and a published author for one of the chapters in the book Kamala Harris and the Rise of Indian Americans, where he wrote about Indian Americans in entertainment. He also co-hosted a podcast from 2019 to 2020 on South Asians called The Omi Show. Vikram is also an actor and played the character of rookie cop Lieutenant Abbas in a 2013 Bollywood TV crime detective pilot called Sherlock Sai. Welcome to the show, Vikram. Thank you so much, Penny. It's really a, an honor to be here. And I have to say that your podcast really channels every Dark Shadows fan's dream, whether it's covering the storylines in depth or different aspects uh, in detail. So uh, it's a great honor and privilege for me to to be on Terror at Collinwood and speak with you. Oh, Vikram, that's very kind of you to say that. Thank you. I appreciate that. Hey, I'm just having a good time. The reason I'm doing this podcast is because I love talking about Dark Shadows with other Dark Shadows fans. So this it's great having you here. And you reached out to me. You were actually one of the 
early listeners who reached out to me when I launched the, I launched the podcast in May of 2021 and you sent me a message on October of 2021, uh, suggesting this really great topic about, um, the cross-cultural appeal and cross-generational impact of dark shadows. And I and you presented this really great idea. And then as I was telling you before we started recording, I mean, once the podcast got going, it just kind of picked up steam and I started more and more people started coming onto it and telling other people and then actors from the show were coming on. And it, I got overwhelmed by that a little bit. I mean, I was delighted about it, but um, but your message was still there un unread because I was going to go get back to you and sch schedule something. And then you followed up with me and asked, like, hey, uh, just following up. And I was like, oh my goodness, I totally spaced on this. So I'm really glad uh, you messaged me, Vikram, because I really like this idea. And thank you for your patience uh, in waiting for to do this. So it's better better late than never. So we're, we're going to have some fun today talking about these topics and dark shadows in general. So I look forward to it. Um, so what was your uh, introduction to dark shadows? That's I always ask that. And my first question usually is like, how did you get, because you, you're, you look like a pretty young guy here. Like, so what, when did you discover dark shadows? Sure. So I discovered dark shadows when I was about, I'd say seven or eight years old. So this is mm -hmm. 1995, 1996. Mm -hmm. um, we had just gotten a new TV and we had just gotten cable. And uh, I remember it was summertime and I was sitting with my mother and she was flipping through channels and she stopped at the sci-fi channel and I remember she was like, oh, Dark Shadows. And I was like, oh, what is Dark Shadows? And she told me that it's this spooky show that she used to watch when she was younger. And, and I remember the scene was the 1995 storyline when uh, Barnabas and Julia, uh, they meet a crazed Carolyn. Yes. So I didn't really know the characters or understand what was going on. The only thing my mother mentioned to me was, was that the man was a vampire and I was just expecting him to bear his fangs. He didn't do that in that particular time, but but that stuck with me. And I think maybe a year or two later, summer vacation again, I saw that Dark Shadows was coming on and it was the um, Ghost of Quentin uh, and Chris Jennings storyline. And I was sucked in. I watched the whole thing. And that was really the beginning of uh, me getting into it because I always had an affinity for spooky things, horror things, you know, the 1930s classic universal horror, Bela Lugosi. So here I saw a show which had all those elements and had this, what I would call an ideal looking haunted house. I mean, Collinwood is as haunted of a house as you can get. So that sucked me in. There's something that really pulls you into it. And just Collinwood itself, it is the you know, the epitome of a haunted house, of a haunted mansion. But you want to explore those rooms with David and Amy. And uh, I remember watching that storyline and just being transfixed by that because they were finding, they find this secret you know, walled off room, Quentin's room. And it's just, it's really captivating to this day. I mean, all that stuff just holds up so well. Um, and um, before we talk about the cross-cultural appeal of Dark Shadows, I want to talk about the cross-generational impact of Dark Shadows, because, you know, you mentioned watching it on the Sci-Fi channel, and I think Dark Shadows did find a lot of younger fans on when it was airing on the Sci-Fi channel, like, because, when Dark Shadows went into syndication, it was kind of spotty. Like, it, you know, some parts of the country, if you were lucky, you were able to, to get it um, in syndication. But it was a big package and uh, these stations would have to run it every single day to sort of in, in order. So it was I think it was daunting for some of these local stations. But, you know, it ran in syndication and continued to pick up fans for sure. But then the double uh, double punch of MPI putting out the tapes and them being available for like rental or to buy at Suncoast Video and things like that. And then you got the Sci-Fi Channel was the first series they picked up. The Sci-Fi Channel, Science Fiction Channel was Dark Shadows. When I remember they announced that in Shadowgram and that was really exciting. So you got all these new uh, fans, these younger fans and original fans watching the show. So what it, what is it about Dark Shadows that you think kind of continues to pick up fans even you know, 55 plus years later, you're still getting new fans coming into the fold. Yeah, I think, you know, first and foremost, uh, although it is horror, it's very accessible horror. You know, it's yeah. not 
too gory mm -hmm. or too disturbing. I mean, of course, it has sad elements in it. It, it. it rarely is anyone truly happy on the show. There's always some yeah. conflict going on. But it's really a mixture of horror, um, a little bit of sci-fi, and uh, I would even say a little bit of adventure because eventually you have Barnabas and Julia and, and mm. Professor Stokes and other characters teaming up to counter whatever supernatural entity is there. So it it has these elements that blend together, but in a very enjoyable way and not one that leaves a bad taste uh, in your mouth. Um, and the fact that it blends everything together, you know, it's not just a vampire show. It's not just a werewolf show or a ghost show. It brings everything together. I think for people that that's, that's amazing. And to do twist after twist, because it was a daily show, it really keeps you hooked. Um, you know, nowadays things are very quick and bingeable and Dark Shadows takes its time and really having you understand the characters and not just get caught up in the supernatural also so it's it's a story it's getting to know the characters and developing a um, a relationship with them so to speak so that i think is what is its enduring appeal i i agree with you um dark shadows is timeless um you know in that it never references, uh, you know, the Vietnam War, which was going on at that time, and other cultural events that were taking place, because it was a very tumultuous period of time in history, uh, in, in, the, in the late, in the 60s, going into the 70s. Um, and Dark Shadows never referenced any of that stuff. It was, it existed, it was horror, but also I agree with, fan, there's a, sci, a little sci-fi, a little fan, fantasy, adventure, all of that in there, It, but it exists in this gothic other world in its own spooky bubble. Uh, and it is creepy and eerie, but it's that terror that pulls you in. But it's also the, the character dynamics, these fascinating multi, uh, multi-faceted characters. You never saw, you know, an ongoing storyline with this much depth, with with, vam with a vampire that becomes the protagonist of the, the series, um, this was super groundbreaking. And I think a lot of people nowadays take this kind of thing for for granted. It's just you know they do see a lot of things like this, um, but Dark Shadows was groundbreaking in that regard. And it does still have that magic for for sure. If you're wired that way, if you like that kind of gothic quality and that ongoing story that combines all of these things like the vampires and the ghosts and the time travel and all of these things, werewolves, witches, etc. And you just go on that journey. And you're right. It, you do live with those characters for, you know, five years of, of story. And I remember when, I, you know, Patrick McCray, the, who wrote the Dark Shadows Day book, was on here and he was talking about, you know, when he finished watching Dark Shadows, because he, he watched all of it in a compressed period of time, he like got worried about Barnabas. He was like, I hope Barnabas is okay. <laughs> but it does kind of leave because you, you, you're you walking along the path with them for, for all that time. So it is certainly, uh, it does that. And it appeals to, it still appeals to younger people. I've had uh, the folks from the Dark Shadows Discord group, you know, who are, you know, Gen Z Dark Shadows fans who are in their 20s and they discover Dark Shadows and they're just as passionate about it as we are, or as the Run Home From School fans are. You know, it's, um, it transcends generations i agree with you um was it so was it your mom that introduced you when you saw it your so your mom had watched it when she was a kid what were her memories of it do you know yeah 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 so she um yeah she watched it when she was a kid she um was born in the u.s and then moved to india for a few years and then when mm -hmm. she was eight years old uh came back uh to mm -hmm. the u.s and so uh it was probably around i'd say 1969 1970 when she she watched it but so she was pretty young um mm -hmm. she watched it because other people in the family watched it and this is you know kind of where both the cross generational and cross cultural aspect comes in so my grandmother used to watch it as well and then my great grandmother used to watch wow. it as well and so <laughs> it was kind of a family thing and uh, uh i think they were especially my great grandmother, I think was kind of the bigger fan than say my grandmother or my mother. Uh -huh. They were more, you know, my mother was more of a casual viewer, but it was my great grandmother who really um, got into it. And, and it's amazing because she, you know, she came from India. She didn't speak English. 
Mm -hmm. And the fact that she was hooked on the show uh, and watched it despite not really understanding what anyone was saying is just testament to not only how it cuts across, uh, you know, uh, generations, but also it cuts across uh, uh, cultures. Yeah. Um, and, uh, you know, we hear about the kids that ran home from school, uh, you know, at 4 p.m. to watch it. But my great grandmother used to run to the couch and uh, watch it. Uh, you know, she would tell my grandmother, oh, you know, it's four o'clock. Turn it on. Turn it on. That's what I heard. So um, I think that that's pretty amazing. I love that. That's so cool. Um, and, and so your grandmother came from came to the U.S. from India. And yes. she, she was did she watch other uh, like daytime serials? Did she watch other soap operas or was Dark Shadows it? Or was it like one of the shows she watched or was it her favorite? Like, well, do you know any right. of that? Right. So uh, so my great grandmother, um, she, I think, only watched Dark Shadows. But my uh -huh. grandmother and my mother actually watched all my children. OK. Yeah. Uh, and they watched uh, One Life to Live as well. And, you know, they watched those shows from the 60s till when they ended. Wow. Uh, about a decade ago. Like my mom was a loyal viewer of those shows. Mm -hmm. um, so th they they were they were into that. Uh, I don't, and I don't know the history so much of how they got into those, but they were really loyal viewers of those daytime shows. Yeah. Yeah. I hear so many echoes in what you're saying. Uh, and with regard to my family as well, because as I've mentioned on the podcast several times, my family came to the U.S. from Portugal, from the Azores, uh, the Azorean Islands, and they didn't speak English either. Uh, my grandmother, it was the same thing, multi-generational. My grandmother watched The Dark Shadows my, with my mom and my aunt and my uncle Valdemar, who was the young kid, he's only, he's a little older than I am, which was, I'm glad he like got into all the pop culture because he then passed that on to me. Even though my mom is a Dark Shadows fan, my grandmother was, but it's not kind of the same where it's like kind of probably like you and maybe your mom, like kind of they liked Dark Shadows and they watched and they remember certain characters and stuff, but were like hardcore into it. You know, uh, Uncle Val was also at that time was hardcore into it. Um, but my grandmother didn't speak any English. and she watched it all the time. She loved she loved it. She was terrified of it though. She was really scared. When Barnabas would show his fangs, she'd go, I'm going to shoot a vampire. And she would hide her face. And uh she was scared, but she she and the werewolf too, when Chris Jennings, I remember watching it with her. And she'd ask, she said, Oh, is he going to turn into a werewolf? You know, she was nervous he was going to turn into a werewolf, but she was, she wanted to watch it. It's interesting. It's like this multi-generational thing happening, cross-generational thing happening. Um because they come over the, to the States and they get into this crazy show that's on TV. So what is it do you, what is it about Dark Shadows that you think has that cross-cultural uh, appeal or cross-cultural impact? Because I've talked to other fans on the podcast too who had similar experiences. So what do you feel it is? So I think in terms of my great-grandmother, probably what I could gauge is the fact that, you know, India is a land that's filled with all kinds of stories mm -hmm. and supernatural stories, legends are a really big part of that. So she came from the state of Rajasthan, which is kind of known as the desert state of India. And there's a lot of palaces, a lot of, you know, kings and royalty that were based in that state. So, you know, there was tons and tons of stories of haunted palaces and, and and things like that. So I'm sure that she grew up with a lot of those things. But the thing is that in India, you know, the visual media, especially in the 60s, um, it was limited to only films. There wasn't really a TV thing there. So, you know, going to the movies was um, a treat, so to speak. Mm -hmm. uh, and even then, horror or supernatural was, you know, I think about in the 40s, 50s, Bollywood used to make those kinds of movies and then kind of lost steam and then it became all about romance and those kind of things. So they weren't making those kinds of stories. So, you know, she comes to the U.S. and she sees the show that has ghosts in it. It has yeah. vampires. Vampire is actually not really a legend that exists in India. So for her, oh, really? it was probably like this really new fascinating thing that she hasn't heard yeah. of. And India has a lot of crazy things, but this one was new. Um, yeah. And so to see that visually, I'm sure to, to kind of 
have something manifest that may have been in her imagination. I think that's what appealed to her. And that might also be the case when you look at kind of the international appeal or cross-cultural appeal of it is just that it it brings things that might exist in other cultures, you know, uh, to a visual form, but it also brings things that, you know, folks maybe haven't heard of, you know, parallel time and 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 things like that, uh, you know, and new things like I Ching wands. I mean, mm -hmm. you know, that, that that's, I think, maybe a, a far, far east thing. I'm not too sure. Mm -hmm. um, but it's just kind of bringing your imagination of things that you grew up with to um, to the fore. And, you know, she, um, you know, from what I understand, my great grandmother had her fair share of seeing uh, supernatural things. Really? Wow. Uh, one particular incident that I was aware of was someone in the neighborhood. They had moved into a new house and um, I believe someone had committed suicide there and subsequently uh, somebody got possessed there wow. and um, you know they had to come and uh, have you know exercise and, and things like that and this was you know where she came from was a fairly small intimate community so to speak so everyone knew what was going on everyone would see these things and mm -hmm. um uh you know so you know for us if we were to see something supernatural either we'd be scared or we'd be mildly fascinated but still maybe look at things with trepidation but in india it's kind of like it was maybe fairly common to wow to hear of things like this or see things like this so um maybe that interest stemmed from kind of personal experiences also. Interesting. Well, um, again, I see parallels too with the Portuguese culture. When I had my friend Rick Rubello on here, we talked a bit about that, like the islands are enchanted and people have all kinds of experiences. But it was interesting because my grand and then my family would tell stories like about paranormal things that they experienced and when they were on the island. But it was interesting because my grandfather is the one who actually experienced more things, but didn't, he didn't, he wasn't into dark shadows. Like he would kind of just roll his eyes when we'd be watching dark shadows. You know, we, I'd be sitting there with my grandmother and uncle Valdemar and me and my young cousin, Karen, my younger cousin, Karen, and we would all be watching dark shadows and he would just kind of just shake his head and walk out. <laughs> <laughs> but he saw, I remember him telling me he, one day he was walking on this wooded path um he was going he was a barber and he was walking to go um to work and it was dusk and he saw all these people uh having like a picnic but they were dressed in old-fashioned clothes and there was no sound like they were all talking and running and play kids were playing and stuff but there was no volume it was but and they were dressed in old-fashioned clothes and then they were gone so it was some kind of weird time slip or something and he rarely talked about these things but if i pressed him i he would tell me some interesting stories um so portugal also has that kind of you know belief and interest or it's just something that exists that we take it's witches to bruxa like a lot of witch witchcraft stuff is that was that is that a thing in uh, india too or some anything prevalent kind of yeah witchcraft for sure yeah witchcraft for sure is definitely a black magic mm -hmm. black magic there's a big a uh, big, big belief in that. Um, you know, I've heard lots of stories of things like that uh, that mm -hmm. my grandparents had seen. You know, things like, um, uh, you know, so in India they have people that are. So you have people that are spiritual men, mm -hmm. and then you have people that are like spiritual men, but they actually are maybe like would be equivalent to like satanists or oh. devil worshipers or things like that and they often promise that they can you know resolve any problem that you have right you just have to do certain certain things so i've i've heard stories about people uh going to them and you know they say something and then like a face manifests on the wall oh, or wow. you know i've heard about uh you know family members well, you know, coming out. Uh, so in India, they have, you know, have really big houses also. I would say those houses are really, really scary because they're very open and they're mm -hmm. gigantic. Uh, they're like maybe Collinwood on steroids. Um, <laughs> and uh, so it's just like, you know, any 
anybody could kind of just walk in. That's the kind of feel they have. So, you know, I've heard of people walking out at night and they see like a woman sitting on like a terrace and then they're like, hey, you know, get off. And then the woman grew in size, like, you know, became a giant, things like that. Um, uh, so, yeah, witch, witches is definitely a very common thing. Warlock type uh, mm -hmm. creatures, even werewolves. It's not exactly werewolf, but it's kind of like were tigers. So oh, speak. yes. I have tigers are yeah. prevalent um, in India. So it's a similar concept. Moon comes out and they turn into something like that. Yeah. Um, so, uh, but I think the biggest thing is definitely ghosts and yeah. possession and witches. That's kind of what most of the legends are are like. On that, on that note, are there any legends or creatures um, in the folklore of India uh, or the fiction, you know, films, et cetera, that you think would have worked in Dark Shadows that would fit into that gothic uh, setting and that gothic storyline of Dark Shadows that would dovetail nicely with that? Yeah, actually. Um, and it's funny because something like this actually could fit within the Leviathan storyline, okay. actually. So in the Leviathan storyline, you know, they talk about the, I think, Naga symbol. Yeah. and So Nag is actually a Hindi word for snake. Oh, so yeah. I okay. believe that that comes from that type of thing. Mm -hmm. uh, but in India, you know, um, there's a big belief in in snakes in the sense that, you know, you never want to upset a snake. You know, mm -hmm. if, if you upset a snake, they will come after you. But there's been legends where people where snakes can actually take a human form. Um, and um, I'm wondering if something like that could fit into like the Leviathan storyline where the you know jeb and we don't know what the creature really looks like could be a giant snake i don't know but you know something like that i think could could fit in and i think a lot of the ghost stories uh kind of the most common ghost stories in india are around desolate mansions and you know women that were maybe wronged by their lovers and their ghosts are still there and it's usually yeah. a, a woman in white holding a single candle. That's usually the image that everyone talks about. Yeah. Um, and there's kind of a sad element to it, a haunting element to it. Um, I feel like something like that could have worked in, in in Dark Shadows because there's lots of characters that have that kind of pain uh, on yeah. the show. Um, and uh, those kinds of visuals and pining for love and that kind of thing, I think that could fit in. Definitely. Um, so I oh, feel like these just... two elements would be interesting in that you, world you just nailed it too but that's a big a big aspect of dark shows that pining for love and the lost love and it's a yearning and a, and a melancholy bittersweet uh, feeling that that would fit perfectly with that and um when you mentioned you know the naga and the leviathan i i absolutely think that they were implying that there was some um uh, you know serpent element to that mm -hmm. creature because that symbol was everywhere with the Leviathans. I don't think, I mean, it didn't look, it look, probably looked more horrifying than that, but um, I had a, a Rick Lay on the podcast and he suggested that it was, it looked like that. It had that multi-hatted serpent look, but he, the serpents had human faces, which which is disturbing. I could see something, may, maybe something <laughs> combined with something more Lovecraftian in the mix there too, of course, since it was inspired by Lovecraft. But I, I love that. That's really cool. Is there anything else you want to say about the cross-cultural or cross-generational appeal of Dark Shadows before I touch on some favorite storylines and characters for you? I think I would just probably reiterate that for generations, it's the ability to see a real story that lingers on um, and see characters evolve um, despite their supernatural things. It's rare nowadays. I mean, nowadays, a lot of things are pretty sensational. Like if it's a, if it's horror, the focus is just on, on the horror. Mm -hmm. It's not really about understanding the characters involved yeah. or the motivations involved. Right. So that's a rare thing. And I think that if you look at generations now, which tend to be a little more emotional, they can probably appreciate that. Um, so that's that's that aspect of it. And then, you know, culturally, of course, it's just, there's nothing like, I mean, quite simply, there's nothing like Dark Shadows. There's nothing that blends everything together uh, so beautifully. Um, and the fact that it's, you know, it's watchable, it's, it's fast moving, it's, you know, it just holds up really well um, because of that. So, 
uh, I think that that's what I would say uh, continues to be the cross-cultural and cross-generational appeal of it. Great. What what do you think the f- future holds for Dark Shadows? One thing I worry about, I was having a discussion with a friend of mine, and he made some good points, too, about a new Dark Shadows might not be, um, it might not be the best thing, because everyone's like, yeah, new Dark Shadows, new sequel show. And he made some compelling points about potential, and I'm going to maybe go into that in another episode. But I, I, I'm still, I think a new Dark Shadows will only benefit the original Dark Shadows. That's That's my feeling even if it's not exactly what I want to see for Dark Shadows. Maybe, I mean, maybe it would be. I would love to see a, something that's truly in the spirit of the original Dark Shadows. Regardless, I think it's going to bring attention to the original Dark Shadows, and we may get things like the Night of Dark Shadows restoration, mm-hmm. um, new merchandise. Um, you know, I'd love to see more of that kind of thing, more uh, attention paid to the original show. So what are your feelings about all of that? Yeah, you know, I, I I did see your episode with uh, Mark Perry. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm very, very excited with the ideas that he has for the new Dark Shadows show. Yes. I really hope that it materializes because, and I think many guests on, on Tarek Khan would have said this, that remaking the original stuff doesn't make sense now because it's been done a couple of times. I think especially that show takes off and it's going to be true. Mm -hmm. to the spirit of the original you know i Mm -hmm. i know that there was a certain film in 2012 (laughs) that kind of botched that uh you know that thing but um you know i think that if if it's presented in the way that it originally is meant to be it can find a new fan base um as well as appeal to the others um i think you've also mentioned frequently about you know, it should be something like Star Trek: The Next Generation. Yeah. Um, and I think that that's that's totally true. And and Mark Perry also, he has so many ideas that kind of bring it with both the original flavor, but also what you know uh, an audience now may connect with. You know, he talked about having a lot of diversity. He talked about just taking the story forward, and I'm sure that you know he can evolve it and touch upon it in a way where the gothic elements are there but also you know horror now is not only just horror it also has some sort of underlying element to it I'm sure there's a way to also bring it there um, Mm -hmm. and connect it that way so I think that um, that show I would say is the hope uh, to to keep the fandom going and keeping it alive and then exposing new audiences to um, the original uh, as well. Um, and it's great that the show is available on so many streaming platforms, Amazon mm-hmm. and, and Tubi, Tubi and all. And I, I'm I'm a brand ambassador for Dark Shadows amongst my friends. I'm telling everyone all the time <laughs> to watch it. Awesome. Actually, um, I'll tell you a funny story. So I think I was in fourth grade when I really became a, like a hardcore fan. So there's a couple of things that happened. One is, um, so sci-fi, I think, had taken off Dark Shadows for a little bit, and then they brought it back. So Mm -hmm. I was very excited. Uh, I remember there was a newspaper ad that they were going to release. the. There's kind of a subscription. This is pre-Netflix and everything. Subscription for the videos. So you would get one volume a month, I think like five bucks, and um, then you would eventually have the whole show. I really wanted it, but my parents were like, no, 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 you know, not, not, not that. So I convinced a friend who kind of was also supernatural. He had an interest in that. I said, why don't you get it? And I'll just borrow the videos from you. Uh-huh. Like, okay, that sounds great. <laughs> so that's, that's, um, that's what I did. But with my friends at school, when we'd go out in the playground, I'm like, let's play Dark Shadows. Oh, I love Need- that. Yeah. So needless to say, I always, since I was the original fan, I always volunteered to be Barnabas, of course. Yeah. Um, uh, but, I love, uh, I love you know, it. and then my, um, you know, I got into theater a little bit and yeah. uh, uh, my drama teachers, um, they knew I was a big fan of the show. So we did a skit uh, called Things That Go Bump in the Night based off of scary scenes from Shakespeare. Mm-hmm. And uh, I was Macbeth in one of the scenes and the teacher played, uh, it was the scene when uh, Macbeth does the murder of um of the king, I, I don't remember the name, but um, Duncan. So yeah. they played the Dark Shadows theme in the scene <laughs> because my teacher knew I was a fan. Yeah. 
Um, oh, I love that. And uh, uh, yeah, so it, it really, you know, from that day, it's been in my life in many different ways as well. You know, like I remember I went to a Warner Brothers studio tour in 2006. This is really funny. I was in like a prop room mm -hmm. and my, uh, you know, this really beautiful painting caught my eye. Nothing else, just painting. And uh, I said, what, you know, what is this painting? And the tour guide said, oh, this was a painting that was a portrait of Barnabas Collins in the 2004 pilot. Oh, wow. And I was like, <laughs> but of course I would, <laughs> yeah. I would you know, um, uh, be attracted to that. That's um, so cool. Yeah. <laughs> so just all these different things uh, over the years where it's just come up also. Yeah. Um, now, does your does your wife, is she a Dark Shadows fan? She is. Um, yeah. Oh, so when, cool. when we got married, I'm like, one of the first things I'm going to introduce you to is is Dark Shadows. And yeah. we started with the, um, you know, the, 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 the unleashing of Barnabas, you know, when yeah. Willie finds Barnabas. And, um, and then we kind of paused it. But right now, we're watching the um, 1897 storyline, which is my all time favorite. And yeah. she's like, completely hooked. Yes. So um, <laughs> great. Uh, yeah, so I've I've made her a fan, and actually, um, on this uh, collage that you see behind me, yes, um, the comic strip book uh, she got me as a yes. gift, um, and you can't really see it. Maybe I'll move yeah, the a video little, version. But, has, uh, <laughs> but several yeah, MPI a, DVDs. Well, there right the... behind me is the Wolf Moon Rising book, yeah, um, which she also got me uh, as a gift. So um, I have converted her. Oh, awesome! <laughs> and you have an eight-month-old. Uh... Yeah. Davy, so are Davey, you? Yeah, yeah. Are you planning to uh, to introduce him to Dark Shadows? Hundred percent, hundred percent. I was actually when I got this whole collection out, um, I was showing it to her, uh -huh. um, but you know, uh, oh, she huh. she she's gaining some understanding. So I think I picked up one the the one that's right next to the comic strip book that has yeah. Barnabas as a um, an old man. I'm going to oh, move yeah. that one. Oh yeah, and yeah. um. You know, she notices that there's something a little off about it, so she just smacked it. <laughs> I but, love uh... that. That's great. <laughs> but, you know, baby yeah. steps. <laughs> right, right. Yes. Um, I want to circle back to a couple of things you said because I love that you played Dark Shadows with your friends. Um, because that was a big thing that a lot of kids in the '60s were doing in the early '70s too, when the show was on. If you, uh, I don't know if you read Running Home to Shadows. Um, it's a collection of you know memories of fans that uh, watched the show originally, and a lot of them talked about playing Dark Shadows or uh, our Shadowed Past, the Bob Bissell's uh, book. He's doing a volume two, actually, that's coming out. I have a piece in, in both books. The second one is actually about my grandmother who spoke no English mm. and loved Dark Shadows. I wrote about her. Um, but he um, has several articles in there that were written by fans who played Dark Shadows when they were kids and they would play the different characters. And several, there was one I was reading, and I think it was in Running Home to Shadows, where she was Josette. She would always be Josette and jump off the cliff and... <laughs> So they would jump off things. She would jump off things to be Josette, uh, which I love. That's great. Um, and the other thing, too, that you mentioned um, with Mark, um, I have full confidence in Mark. Um, Mark I, is, as you heard in the interview I did, Mark B. Perry, he is a big Dark Shadows fan. He's a true blue Dark Shadows fan. It's not Mark that I was worried about. And when I was talking to my friend, I did agree with a lot of what he said. Um, in a lot of the the... I guess the platforms potentially that it would be on might want to put their two cents in and push for different things that we may not like. That's what I meant. I wasn't mm -hmm. seeing it about what Mark would do because I have full faith right. in him. Um, for example, when he was with the CW, uh, CW, when he was going to do it on the CW, they wanted to turn the Blue Whale from a fisherman's tavern that was where everybody in town would just go hang out to like a retro hipster bar. And I was like, nah, the CW was like pushing for that. So he said he was glad to kind of DCW his script, his pilot script when he got, when CW didn't end up doing it. And I was re actually relieved about that because I don't want them to mess it up. Yeah. Like I want it to be Dark Shadows, not through the lens of the CW or whatever other platform it's on. So I, I can see where there would be stumbling blocks um, mm -hmm. with that. But yeah, I mean, I, I think... I, I can foresee issues like that more so with mainstream networks. Yeah. yeah. Uh, streaming, I feel, has given creators a lot more latitude mm -hmm. to do what they want. Um, yeah. You know, like uh, if you look at a show like um, 
uh, it's Castle Rock, I think it's called. Okay, yeah. Uh, you know, on on Hulu, based off of Stephen King. I mean, it it really Stephen King's from from Maine, mm -hmm. uh, or he lives in Maine, I think. And uh, you know, he has that certain kind of flavor in his works, and uh, it it's very true to it. So I feel like streaming platforms, you know, because the, you, you know, getting into kind of the business of it, they they are based on subscribers, not so much on advertisements. So you know, there's a lot more creative freedom um, and you can find like niche audiences for different shows on streaming. So they're more open to those visions. So I think that if it comes on a streaming platform and most people are streaming things nowadays anyway, yeah. I don't foresee there being too many compromises, so to speak. Mm -hmm. um, I think it can be close to... Um, the vision that all of us fans want it to be. Yeah. Okay, great. Is there a particular streaming platform that you would favor for that or? Uh, no, I mean, I, I, I think no particular, whichever one yeah. I would, I would watch it no matter where it is. Yeah. Same. Um, yeah. I know people, <laughs> people say shutter and things like that, which is fine. It's horror specific, but I, I don't Kinda think, small. Uh, well, yeah, but I also don't think a lot of the audience for shutter is, you know, so Shudder has very some very intense horror things. True, I think true. Dark Shadows is a little bit more light than yeah. that. They might I, like it there, but I think like it could be on a broader platform mm -hmm. than horror yeah. specific, I think. Like Hulu maybe or something like, like that. Like Hulu, yeah. yeah. Hulu. Yeah. Hulu, I think, would be a good one. I um, agree. Yeah. Ultimately, whoever lets it be what it should be. <laughs> yes, totally agree. So what are what are some of your favorite uh, characters and storylines from Dark Shadows. And you mentioned the 2004 pilot that didn't get picked up, but can be seen on YouTube. Uh, yeah. And um, it was Alec Newman, uh, you know, uh, Barnabas. And then we have the, the 91 series as well. We have the two uh, movies, the 2012 movie. What are some thoughts on, I guess, all of them? Favorites from the original and then other thoughts on subsequent iterations? Yeah. Um, so when we talk about the original, I mean, that's untouchable. I, I love yeah. everything about it. But if I were to pick, like, if I were to pick one character that I really like, I would actually say um, Quentin. Oh, uh, Quentin, uh, original, you know, original. As a kid, although I played Quentin. as Barnabas, I would, <laughs> I would say Quentin because yeah. Quentin to me, I felt was actually an even more interesting character than Barnabas. And the reason is because Barnabas always was a bit of a romantic. Mm -hmm. um, he was soft hearted. He was you know, as a vampire, he, you know, he, you still really felt for him, but, yeah. but he was always a bit soft. So, you know, when he had the dilemma, you're like, I see it, you know, I see it. Yeah. But Quentin, he was not a nice guy when he started out. Um, You don't really feel any sympathy for him. You're like, this guy's a womanizer. He's, you know, stealing the will and he's manipulating people. And he, he you know, uh, all this, all this kind of stuff. Yet, you know, as the story develops and when he gets the werewolf curse, which, you know, even at that point, you're like, okay, this guy kind of deserves this yeah. because he left, you know, spoiler, he, he left Jenny and the kids and, and all that, you know. But then for some odd reason, which I still don't quite understand, you you feel bad for him too later on because he mm -hmm. changes. He, he, he becomes softer. He, you know, he does feel the pain that, that he has caused and yes. that you know um i think there's a line where uh i don't remember if, if one of the babies dies or something like that but he says something about oh it's another quentin collins and i think th the transformation happens to the baby or i don't remember exactly but you see his pain that his child is going through something or is very sick or something yes um yeah. and right. uh so i just found that his character was more fascinating because you hate him and then you feel bad for him. Whereas Barnabas, he always was kind of likable and, and a gentleman and stuff like that. Quentin was not. Yeah. Um, so I would say he was, he was my, um, he's my favorite, uh, favorite character. Mm -hmm. um, at the other things, uh, the 1991 show I liked, um, I just felt it was a remake though of House of Dark Shadows and, yeah stuff from the original so that's the only detraction but i think the production values the cast was was really good and boy i mean they had that great cliffhanger 
on the twelfth episode. I mean, yeah, it would have been great to see where they go, you know, where they went with that, and whether they would bring Quentin, and what would that pan out like. There were, um, plans, there were they plans to bring Quentin, and it was going to be Adrian Paul who played Jeremiah. Okay. Okay. Yes, he was. He had said, and he revealed at a Dark Shadows festival that they were bringing him back. Right. as Quentin, um, which, man, what a what a bummer that that didn't happen. That, yeah. that would have been so cool, yeah. Yeah, so so I, I, I liked the 1991 series. Um, I just didn't, you know, it was a remake, so that was mm-hmm. the only thing. Uh, 2004 pilot, I, I was not really a fan of. Um, yeah. I, 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 it felt very different. It didn't have the kind of Dark Shadows feel to it. Mm-hmm. Um, and they made some character choices, which I can understand why they did what they did. But, you know, when you have these loyal fans, it doesn't work. You have to cater to, you have to find a way to cater to new people and the originals. And this was just trying to get a new base. So um, the actors were fine. I just wasn't too sure of the way that the the thing was was put together, the characters. Um the Dark Shadows 2012 movie, I was super excited. I said, okay, Tim Burton, Johnny Depp, okay, this could work. Sleepy Hollow, if it's like that. Yeah. Um, of course, it it turned out to be a comedy. Um, if I view it as a comedy, it's fine. But then my mind, of course, always goes back to the fact that this is Dark Shadows. I always had this dream that if they made a real Dark Shadows movie, I think Johnny Depp was a great choice for Barnabas. I felt like if they were to have a Quentin, it should be Hugh Jackman. Oh, I don't know why. Okay. I, always, I could see that. Yeah, you know, maybe it's like the Wolverine. I don't know. Yeah, I could see that. <laughs> but I thought Hugh Jackman could be a good um, Quentin. Um, but I mean, that's not going to happen. But uh, yeah. yeah, so I, I think after the original, maybe only the 1991 show I really like. I love the two 70s movies, Mm -hmm. uh, Night of Dark Shadows and House of Dark Shadows. Night of Dark Shadows, you know, I know it was was edited and and changed up a lot, but there's still something about it which makes me want to watch it over and over again. I don't know what it is. Uh, But yeah, that's kind of my... Yeah. my views on all these iterations yeah that's great um what about like licensed media like the ross novels the gold key comics you have the newspaper strip book you were t- just talking about do you like any of that stuff you know i, I haven't read um uh, you know besides wolf moon rising i haven't really oh. read like you know say the marilyn ross books or things yeah. like that um i'd love to i just need to find some time to do it because there is <laughs> a, a lot, lot there are a lot of them <laughs> Right. Uh, and I also haven't heard the um, the audio productions either, which I would I would love to be interested to know where they took the story. Um, uh, and, you know, actually, there's a I think oh, in one I thought the you were, I'm sorry. I thought you were talking about Catherine Lee Scott reading the the, the Ross novels. Uh, you're talking about the big Finnish audios. I see what you're saying. Sorry. Yeah, some it's the mix bag. I like there are some I really like and some I'm like, what is going on here? So. It's right. it's a mixed bag. Like I think the more recent ones, I'm not as gung ho about. Like earlier on, I felt like they were trying to go for more of that spooky gothic atmosphere. Um, but the more recent ones are, um, there were like kid characters in it, like brought in like oh, young God. characters, and I found them a little grating. But you know, that, I'm, that's my opinion. But um, but some of the some of the ideas that they have are really cool, and some of them yeah. are pretty spooky and, and interesting it depends like it's a there are a lot of different writers and some of them are more knowledgeable about the dark shadows than others sometimes the vibe is like off but so is it even all of these different iterations how these licensed versions have their own vibe like the ross novels very different from the series like the first five are pre-barnabas so those feel and you can tell he was using like art wallace's uh bible show bible because it's there's a lot of there are a lot of elements that come from those uh, pre-Barnabas episodes. And I, I kind of dig those. But then once Barnabas comes in and the, he starts adding all of these family members, it gets it gets a little, the vibe is different. It's unique. It's it's fun. I mean, you can kind of get into it, but it's its own very distinct feel. And the characterizations are, I would say, a bit different, particularly Barnabas feels different to me than he does in the show. 
Um, but they're fun. And I'm doing, I'm going to do an episode. People keep asking me, when are you going to do an episode on the Ross novels and the gold key comics? I, it's coming, <laughs> folks. Great. Soon. Yeah. And I I, I did actually um, return to Colin, what is the only audio oh, that yeah. I've heard. And I actually loved it. I, mm -hmm. um, well, of course, the fact that a lot of the original actors are there, that's, that's wonderful. But mm -hmm. they even used the musical cues. Yes. Which, yeah. which was great. Uh, you know, it's just a fun thing it, i i think you know um it, it's just great for the nostalgia and for yeah. you know learning about the possibility of things that could have happened post mm -hmm. uh the way the show ended um yeah. you know and uh and i think you know um there's also in one of the dvds there's like a 10 minute video where they explain what happened to the characters? Oh, that's that? the, from the Sam Hall article that was published in TV Guide mm -hmm. um, uh, after the show because people were demanding, like, what what happens next? You know, so Sam Hall wrote this article for TV Guide. And, of course, Sam Hall was one of the key writers in Dark Shadows, but, you know, Dan Curtis was not involved in that, and neither was Gordon Russell or Violet Wells or any, any of the other, or Joel Caldwell, but Sam Hall wrote the article. So, and I think this was, like, what Sam would like to have seen happen in the show, but it's... You know, some I don't necessarily consider that canon, but it is an interesting. <laughs> I see it as a what if kind of a possibility, like Return to Collinwood. I see that as a what if too. Um, and he uh, wrote that, and then they they had it on the end of the the DVD, one of the last right. DVD. Yeah, they they had the rundown there because he had ideas in there that's like, um, that I wasn't sure if they would do. There was some like world traveling stuff, which I don't know if they would have done that in Dark Shadows. And Adam comes back, and some of the actors who had left the show were back in and i'm like i don't know if that would have happened but hey you never know it could have it could have happened there's one anecdote actually i did want to share which i think sure a lot of listeners may may find this as maybe sweet or something but um you know uh dark shadows was what really got me into acting uh yeah. jonathan frid and, and david selby were, were my idols and i was like this is this is something i really enjoy i wasn't athletic but i needed to do something and acting turned out to be the thing so uh, i remember uh maybe i was in sixth or seventh grade and uh, uh i found david selby's website okay. and at that time i think he had an email address listed and i'm like i'm gonna write david selby an email and ask him for advice on acting uh, because I was a fan. So I wrote him an email and he responded. I still have that email saved in a, wow. a drawer uh, somewhere, so but cool. um, I, I didn't write in there how old I was. I must've been maybe 13, 14 years old, but uh, so he's like, oh, you didn't give me your age, but I guess he could sense maybe the way that I wrote it, that I was really young. So he's like, you didn't give me your age, but you should continue to do theater and see if that's you know, if you enjoy it. And if you enjoy it and that's something you really want, then continue to pursue it. So I, I printed that uh, email out and I've saved it because it was really inspiring and it was thrilling to get a response uh, from, from Mr. Selby. So um, uh, that's another fond memory. <laughs> yeah. Oh, what a great story. Thank you for sharing that. And it just, it speaks to the kind of person David Selby is. He is such a nice person and how, cool that he took the time to write right. to a young fan and give advice on on acting that's so cool I'm, and uh, yeah I would never part with that that's a that's a keeper that that email <laughs> I'm glad you printed it out and saved yeah. it you called out the music from Dark Shadows and you being used in Return to Colin Woodrow which I agree was the right choice if there's a new Dark Shadows I would love new orchestrations of some of the classic themes from the show, including, of course, the opening title, which I was shocked they didn't do in the Burton movie. Like, you didn't do a version oh, yeah. of Danny Elfman. They did one little, uh, they pulled something from Colbert, from Robert Colbert in the very opening, that this, that, that thing. Yeah. But they, that's all they did. Um, yeah. But I would love to see some some of the key music cues reorchestrated in a new series. That would be really cool. And it just would feel like Dark Shadows. Now, they didn't really, I don't think they did that in Star Trek The Next Generation and during the show, that was something they didn't do. But for Dark Shadows, I feel like you kind of have to have some of those, even if it's not all of them, I think they have to have some of those themes in the mix. I, I agree. And, you know, my all-time favorite Dark Shadows composition is uh, Joanna's theme. 
Oh, I love that one. Oh, yes. uh, love it. it's, that it's, doesn't get enough credit. It's yeah. yeah. I feel it's very underrated. I guess maybe because it came at a time in the show where the show was nearing the end. Mm -hmm. um, but I think, you know, in the movie Night of Dark Shadows, that's actually where I first heard it. I was mm -hmm. like, this is this is beautiful. I mean, my my father, he loves it. He's like, oh, play that. Play that Dark yeah. Shadows music. <laughs> um, and then, you know, my wife has heard it. It's just it's one of the most beautiful musical interludes ever. I hope they bring that back. It's just it's a yeah. love. Sometimes if I'm driving to work and it's like November and it's drizzly and the leaves are blowing, like here in New England, you know, and the leaves are uh, blowing everywhere. I put that on in my car and I'm driving. It just feels like it captures that mood perfectly. Exactly. It really does. Um, but yeah, awesome. Very good call there with Joanna. You don't hear people call that one out too often and, and they should get more uh, attention than it does it's that Robert Colbert was brilliant I mean and just the various styles and themes that he worked into the show were incredible and just even like people talk about oh, Dark Shadows uh, when it started was more or less a standard soap opera it wasn't it was always very Not unique I mean with that music orchestral music um, you had these sets by Cy Tomashoff that were incredible beautifully the detailed best. sets i mean just Im immersive kind of environments and you have joan bennett movie a movie star this majestic movie star uh in the series it just it Im immediately was something different um it was unique from the start even before the overt supernatural stuff came in it was something special right away um so i i hope that vibe if anything new comes out is retained for it um, yeah. it needs that all of that needs to be in the mix there well um, you know if, if dark shadows reincarnation is a continuation of the original it would be really cool if they recreated those sets um to show the interior of collinwood um yeah i i really you know it's funny because i've seen pictures of what sea view yes. terrace is actually like on the inside yeah, it's amazing and i wish yeah. it was like the show <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know what you mean. There are elements, you can tell Cy Tomashoff pulled certain elements from the actual Seafood Terrace in and used them in the set design, like the paneled walls, the wood paneling. Right. He used some of those things in the show, some of the um, stained glass stuff. I mean, he worked some of it into the set design, but you know, you walk in, it looks different. Uh, it's certainly, but it's really impressive when you walk into Seafood Terrace and it's like, wow um and it's just the fact that you're in collinwood is kind of surreal <laughs> it's, right it's, and people watching dark shadows inside collinwood is even more surreal the most <laughs> surreal experience i had inside seaview terrace is i'm standing in the foyer area and they have a room they call it some they call it the dark shadows room or the 60s room the angel room they have different names for it but in that room there's a tv playing dark shadows constantly and i was standing there and in the distance i hear roger collins voice like talking on the tv with, elizabeth really it's like, it's like oh. you can almost see that that's going yeah. on yeah it's so room. weird it's so it's so <laughs> it was surreal um but yeah that would i i hope so you're right if they were to do that and that's what you know mark said that they would he would push to have like a recreation of the interior of what Colin would of Colin would from the TV show, but probably probably maybe bigger. Uh, I don't know, but yeah. I hope it looks like that, like immediately recognizable as Colin would or the old house or any of those locations. Like, yep, that's that's right. That's what it looks like. You know, I right. agree. Yeah, and, and um, I don't know if you saw this news story, but there is a guy who is a big fan of the show, and he's mm. built a house that looks like Colin would, and yes, I think inside he's. Um, even copied some of the set style. That was totally. like, that, that is cool. <laughs> that's in Pennsylvania. That's a dream. <laughs> yes, that's in Pennsylvania. Uh, if yeah. you're listening to the show, uh, I would love to come uh, visit and do an episode with you at your house. That was... <laughs> <laughs> he's, he's like, you imagine like having the ability to create your own Collinwood to live in. He has, right. it looks like, yeah, he did like things on the inside of right. the uh, of the house to make it look like it. Do you know if Dark Shadows got any airings like in syndication in India at all? Because I know it aired in like South America and several other places, Central America, South America, but I don't know if it, if it made it out to India at all. So I don't know if it, if it aired in India, but 
I do know that um, it did reach India in some form because my aunt, uh, who was born there, who grew up there, um, she told me that as a kid, she had a book. I think it may have been one of the Marilyn Ross books called Barnabas Collins or oh, okay. Destroy Barnabas Collins. So that was available in India. So yeah. um, at least in that form, it was there. I don't know if the show actually aired there or not. Okay. But, that yeah. happened in the UK as well. Like a lot of the Marilyn Ross novels, the paperback library novels were distributed in the UK. It was like overflow stock or what he from here, from the US made it over the UK. So bookshops could keep, younger people in the UK during that time, in the, like in the seventies, where that's how they experienced Dark Shadows, a lot of them that found them. So I'm sure there are probably a group of fans probably in the UK that grew up with the Ross novels as their Dark Shadows. Uh, and then of course, when the sci-fi channel came, then it developed a fan base for the show there right. as well. Um, but yeah, that's interesting. That's, the Ross novels made their way to India too. That's really cool. Um, awesome. Well, Vikram, uh, it's been an absolute pleasure getting to talk with you. I'm so glad we finally Absolutely. got to do this. I'm so happy that we were able to get together. It was a pleasure hearing from you. Uh, and you're you're a writer. Um, and you, are you doing any writing right now? Uh, no, it's just things. A lot of the things have been a little bit on pause. Just uh, you know, been busy with the with the baby and, yeah. and all. But you know, one of the things I I would like to do is you know write some short stories, uh, some horror stories, maybe. Yeah. Um, because that's what I love. And I'd love to stretch my imagination uh, in yeah. that space. But as to when I can <laughs> sit down and do that, uh, I'm not sure. Hopefully, hopefully yeah. soon. Well, you have your hands um, full with an eight month old. Uh, yeah. So yeah. I don't yeah, believe yeah. <laughs> but when the dust settles and you got a little more time, that'll be yeah. very great. Yeah. Um, but you know, this, this really, for me, this is an honor for me to, to be on, on Terra at Collinwood. Again, I think oh. this is, this is such a wonderful celebration of dark shadows it really encapsulates everything uh a fan would would want and and you're an amazing host as well uh, you know i you. don't think there could have been anyone better to do this Aww. so uh so this is really exciting and great and and i you know look forward to future episodes and and uh you know continuing to see everything uh dark shadows channeled here so it's oh. really an honor and uh, privilege for me to to speak with you on this oh that's very kind thank you so much vikram i really appreciate that and uh, I, I love having fun on the dark shadows it should be fun you know and talking about it and having a good time celebrating it and i'm honored to have done so with you so thank you for for joining me and, and hopefully we can do it again sometime Sounds great. Uh, i don't i don't plan on stopping the podcast anytime soon so uh <laughs> as, as long please as things don't keep... <laughs> please don't keep it going keep it going well uh, hey thank you and uh, folks if you like the podcast please do rate it. Uh, if you're listening on Apple Podcasts, please give us a rating. That does help the podcast to reach more Dark Shadows fans. If you know someone that loves Dark Shadows and loves hearing discussions about Dark Shadows, this is like a, a radio show or a TV show or whatever kind of show that's just a, specifically about Dark Shadows, but also related topics that are in the Dark Shadows orbit. Let your friends know about it. Give us a rating. Like the podcast on, if you're watching the YouTube version, there's a video version of most of these episodes. Subscribe, please, to the YouTube channel. But most importantly, above everything else, tell your friends. If you know somebody that loves Dark Shadows or that might enjoy the podcast, um, I have had some fans that have said, well, I've been there, done that. I've heard it all. No, you haven't because you have not heard from Vikram before about Dark Shadows <laughs> and now you have. So uh, please tell your friends because you different perspectives from different fans are what it's all about. So thank you again, Vikram. I appreciate it. Thank you. <laughs> Hey, just real quick, I want to let you know that I will be doing an appearance as Penny Dreadful at Monster Expo on April 27th and 28th, 2024 at the Seaport Resort at 110 Middle Street, Fairhaven, Massachusetts. So come on down to Monster Expo. Come by my table. If you listen to the podcast, let me know. I'll give you a Terror at Collinwood sticker. Other guests include Eugene Clark, Bill Mosley, and Camille Keaton. So come on by Monster Expo at the Seaport Resort, April 27th and 28th. It's going to be a excellent time. <laughs> And for as long as they lived, 
the dark shadows never truly vanished, for there will always be Terror at Collinwood. Terror at Collinwood is a Penny Dreadful production.